I began diving in 1999 and immediately fell in love with it. I loved looking at the reefs, the corals, the fish, but one thing was very, very haunting. No matter where I went, didn't matter if it was Thailand, the Caribbean, I heard the same thing over and over again. You should have seen the reefs 10 years ago. What you're seeing now is just a shadow of what the reef used to look like. It was more vibrant, it had more fish, the corals were healthier, and I heard this just about everywhere I traveled. As a filmmaker, the disappearance of the Earth's coral reefs, especially the hard corals, seemed like something that I wanted to investigate in the form of a documentary. So over the last two years, I've been traveling the world, mostly looking at restoration programs, efforts to try and bring back the coral reefs to the health they were before. This exploration became putting the pieces together, the story of hard coral reefs marching towards extinction due to global warming and efforts to prevent that effect by bringing corals back in places that lost them due to mass bleaching events. The story starts in Micronesia, on the island of Koh Shrai. Koh Shrai is different. Koh Shrai is the one place where people don't tell me the reefs have changed in the last 15 years. This is one of the few places left where ancient hard coral colonies, thousands of years old, dominate the landscape. I came here to show what coral reefs all around the world used to look like before the 1980s brought rising sea surface temperatures. Koh Shrai has one of the few reefs that, for the moment, remain unaffected by global warming. Here, I followed a coral monitoring program that has been protecting the local reef environment since 1996. Started by a dive shop, the island community has since embraced it, and as a result, Koh Shrai has one of the most amazing displays of coral vitality and diversity left in the world. One that is pretty much untouched by the effects of humans. The next stop is in the Florida Keys, where weather changes brought on by El Nino weather patterns in the 1980s and 90s turned the vibrant reefs into a virtual coral graveyard. I interviewed people through the Keys, locals and experts alike, to learn what happened. But the big uh, tr trees, they looked like trees of Acapora, like on Lou Key. They were, some of them 15 and 20 foot tall. They're gone. And today, you might see a few stumps of those, probably about three foot tall stumps sticking up off the rocks covered in green algae. And that's all that's left of those. The reefs that we see today, like at Luke Key Reef, are just a remnant of what we saw in the past. And in fact, in description, you see more barren surface now than, than, than actually living coral. And that's a sad thing, because I remember what it used to be like. I, use, I remember the colors, I remember the healthy coral colonies, I remember the three dimension. You couldn't put your hand down on the bottom without touching something that was living. The events in Florida left many questions, but some of the most sophisticated technology helped find the answer. And there appeared to be some possibility that sea surface temperature had a role with some of this bleaching that they were seeing in the corals. And as my students started looking at that with our satellite data, there did seem to be an interesting link. And so as we developed that further, we found out that satellites could be used globally, just assessing these corals for whether they were experiencing high, higher than normal sea surface temperature. Climate change is here and that it's affecting our planet. And it's really affecting our coral reefs. Increasingly, we're seeing more and more of these reefs lose their characteristics and lose their life and become ghost towns uh, as a result of these high temperatures. But not all hope is lost in Florida. One industrious tropical fish collector in Key Largo is single-handedly bringing staghorn coral back from the brink of extinction. Ken Niedemeyer's Coral Restoration Foundation is now busy replanting more than 5,000 staghorn corals raised in his protected nursery. Here is an edited scene from a promo video I made for Ken's foundation. The idea to create a coral nursery came when Ken helped his daughter Kelly with a local club project. My daughter was had a, she was looking for a 4-H project. And here in the Florida Keys, we can't do the traditional 4-H things, so we uh, decided we'd raise coral. Well, during that period of time, as we were growing our corals, we started looking around. And I realized, boy, these corals are in a lot of trouble out in the wild. When I was growing up down here and in the 70s, I remember seeing patches of coral that were several acres in size. 
and now I go back to those same areas and they're, they're just one or two remnant colonies, no bigger than a basketball. Halfway across the world, small Pacific islands like those found in Indonesia rely on their dying coral reefs for survival. But a specialized form of electrified coral restoration called BioRock offers hope. Co-developed by Tom Garo of the Global Coral Reef Alliance, not only can it restore coral reefs up to six times faster than normal, but it also protects the delicate animal through periods of deadly bleaching. Here is a clip from a video I created about a BioRock volunteer workshop in Indonesia. Back on the boat, Dr. Garo begins to sort through the harvest. Oh, good. Some nice little purple acroporas and yellow ones. And these may be the same species. I'm not really, they look very similar, but the colors are different. As the boat nears a new bio-rock reef, the divers gear up for a longer dive, and the baskets of orphan pieces are handed out. We usually tie the coal with steel wire or cable tiles, and the coal is going to grow faster because we're speeding up the normal chemical reaction for a hard coal to grow limestone and their structure. What started for me as an interest evolved into a dedicated mission. It became my goal to help educate people about the importance of saving hard coral reefs through my documentary work. This was all done on my own. No professional crew other than myself, no outside funding, and no sponsorship. As part of my mission, for each nonprofit organization I work with, I create and donate promotional videos that they can use in helping educate people on coral health issues, as well as to further their own organization's goals. These can all be found online at vimeo.com slash channels slash putting the pieces together. I'm proud to say I'm also an active participant in each project that I've documented. The feature documentary, Putting the Pieces Together, is finished with filming, and short programs have already been made from the footage, but there are months of editing still ahead. Any winnings will go directly toward the documentary's remaining expenses. This Paddy contest will receive mention in the credits as a sponsor. I have two hopes. First, that Putting the Pieces Together gets selected for some of the more prominent film festivals in 2012, and second, that people recognize the seriousness of what is happening to our reefs and to the oceans as a whole. If my film can encourage people to consider their role in environmental stewardship by calling attention to the plight of hard corals, I feel like I have done the greatest service I can offer to help heal the world's oceans.